today. We look at Luke 16. And we want to read verses 1 through 18. But before we do, we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we thank You and praise You for who You are. For Your character and Your nature and Your unchangeableness. <clears throat> that we can trust in You. Father, we commit this day and these thoughts into your hands, knowing that all that we have that's good and right and of value comes from you. That your grace and the person of your Son produces the things in us that we need. Your Spirit is given to us to bless us and to guide us and to empower us and to give us that life that we need. Lord, we leave it all with Thee. And we trust it with Thee. And we ask, Lord, that we may not count Thy blessings and Thy treasures a little thing. But Lord, that the very food on our table and the very breath that we breathe in our lungs, we may gratefully receive and use, use it all for the glory of our Savior and for the work of our Christ. Our Lord, who is one of us, surely understands us. He knows our frame that we are but dust. And so we ask today, O oh God, that you would forgive us and help us. And Lord, keep us in thy will, we pray. So that in that day that we give an account, we may do so with joy. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. I guess if you thought about it today, you would realize that God keeps records and God keeps books. That God looked at your Christian life today and He wrote down what you did and what you didn't do. What you thought and what you didn't think. The opportunities you missed and those you took advantage of. God keeps a record of it all. But I wonder today if you've ever thought that you need to keep books and records. Or at least you need to be aware of what you're doing with what God has given you. Because as this <clears throat> parable teaches us, and one day that we realize that we will have to, all of us are going to have to give an account for our life and the precious valuable things. The knowledge that God put into it, the opportunities to serve Him, the gifts and the talents and the abilities, the cars, the money, the children, the families, the chances to witness and all the rest. God is going to require that we give an account of the things that He has given to us. And I hope you realize today, and it may be a shock for some of you to think about it in this way, that everything that you have is God's. It's not your house, it's God's house. It's not your car, it's God's car. It's not your job, it's God's job that He enabled you to get and gives you the strength to work in it. And He's put you there and kept you there for a reason and His purpose. It's not your church you're working in. It's God's church. It's not your wife and your family to do with uh, and to do as you please. All that you have is God's. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. 
the psalmist said. And it is so. And God has let you borrow a few, perhaps many, precious things. All of us have many precious things in our life. Priceless things that we do not value at all, but that God values. And the money is the, the least precious of them all. And the cars and the houses and the good health and all the rest. They don't matter to God so much as they matter to us. But God has given you precious things. He's given you time and life and abilities. And if you're saved, He's given you eternal life and, and, and a membership in His family and the help of the Holy Spirit and the understanding of the Word of God. God has given you precious things. Priceless things. And make sure of this. That God is no slacker. He will do His job. And God is going to require that we give evidence of how we use the things that are His that He's given us to use. And that's going to take place at the judgment seat of Christ. The Bema seat of Christ for the believer. It's not going to be a judgment to decide whether you go to heaven or not. But it is going to be a judgment to see how you're rewarded in heaven. It's going to be a judgment to evaluate your Christian life. And your Christian life doesn't save you. <clears throat> Living down here for Jesus doesn't save you. But God will reward faithfulness where there is faithfulness. And God will reward the using especially of His precious gift. And we must give an account. And there will be a day of that. And every idle word shall be brought into judgment, the Bible says. And Paul says that it is no light thing. That it is a very serious thing. And he said, knowing the, the terror and judgment of the Lord, we persuade men. I don't know how much you think about that day. We have the grace of God now, but in that day when our works are judged, there will be no grace there to forgive us for the failings that we did. There will be no bringing back the lost opportunities then. Salvation is free, and the grace of God now is free, and even the ability and the strength to live the Christian life, God supplies, but... When the work's done and the evaluation takes place, it'll be on what is done and what is not done. And there'll be no picnic for any of us. And especially if you've been careless with God's things. I think about our children. I think about even my own childhood life and I... I sometimes tell the story that when I was a teenager one Christmas, I remember that we got a bunch of things, as we always did, clothes, but a bunch of toys. And I got interested in one particular toy that I had, and it was two years later that I found three or four of the presents that I'd got that Mom put up in the closet that I'd never played with, never did play with them. I'd gotten so much that I'd lost track of all that I'd got. And God's given you so much that possibly you don't even know all the things He's given you and you're letting His precious gifts lie unopened and unused and wasted. Their value not being put into operation. I tell you that you must give an account of the things that God has given you. And we see how we can give an account of that in this first 18 chapter of the verses of the look, the uh, 16th chapter of Luke. Let's read that today. <clears throat> and he said also unto his disciples, <clears throat> there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship. 
for thou mayest no longer be steward. And then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig, and to beg I am ashamed. <clears throat> I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one his Lord's debtors, and said unto the first, how much thou owest my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. And he said to another, How much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the sons of this age are in their generation wiser than the sons of life. And I say unto you, make to yourself friends by means of money, of unrighteousness, that when it fails, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in that which is least is also unjust in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in unrighteous money, who shall commit to your trust the true riches. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are those which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John, and since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. And you're going to have to give an account of the things that God has given you. And how can you do that? Verses 1 through 9 tells us to use money and material things to do his will. Now the point of the parable is not that money is the true riches. It isn't. We can't serve God in money. Money is the lesser and the, the thing that God is not so much interested in as the faithful factor. But he does tell us here. And he, he did commend this wicked, wasteful thief that he had as a steward who he had to kick out of his job because he was a bad steward and, and abused his privilege and wasted his Lord's money and, and didn't do a good job. But he commended him because he made deals by using the bills that were owed to his Lord to provide a shelter for him after he lost his job and his stewardship. And the point of what he's saying in verses 1 through 9 is <clears throat> that we are to use material things for the purposes of God. He gave them his goods in the parable. But he wasn't faithful. He stole from his master. He wasted his master's money. He didn't do a good job in his stewardship. And, and the master found out about it and said, you're going to have to uh, get, I'm going to check the books and see what you've done and you're going to lose your job. And so he went out quickly and, and used money to make friends with the people by letting them pay less than they actually owed. And they were glad to do it, to, to, to get the benefit of, of a bargain deal with what they owed the steward's law. And in and 10 and 11, we have this thing that the money is not the important thing, but is the least thing. And we have here what is said. 
in 10 and 11. He that is faithful in least is also faithful in much, but he that is unjust in least is unjust in much. And the point is, if God gives us houses and cars and monetary things and money and goods and computers and TVs and radios and phonographs and recording machines and we don't use those things in a faithful way that benefit Him in His will, then how is He going to give us the true riches that mean something that are important to Him? And the point is that even the lesser things, which are the monetary things, God requires faithfulness in them. I tell you, it's not just your time that is God's. And it is. We, we need to give Him a tenth at least or more or better than what we have. But God expects you to use all of it according to His will. And he doesn't expect you for to use most of it unless you have very meager income at all. Uh, if you have any extra, he doesn't spend, expect you to spend most of his money and most of his budget on entertainment and pleasure and things that you want. But he expects you to use it for getting the gospel into this world of doing the things that materially have to be taken care of in his work. And we're going to give an account for that. And we better consider and realize that it all belongs to God. And, and sure, God doesn't mind us having a steak dinner once in a while. And God doesn't mind us, uh, there's ne nothing necessarily wrong with buying a new car. There may be times when that is the most economic, smart, sensible thing to do. But if we're constantly lavishing ourselves with the best, and frivolous things that do not matter to pamper this old shell that our Lord lives in. The treasure is our Lord, and the, this old body is just a pot of clay, the Bible says. But we spend all the money and the time and the energy and the entertainment on the pot of clay, and one day you and I are going to have to give an account for that. And how much billions of dollars we spend in America on our pets every year. Now, I'm not against having a pet, and neither is God. But if the money that we spend on something that does not matter is wasted and we spend nothing on the cause of Christ, we use nothing in the money and our goods and our cars and our TVs and our computers and our recording systems, we do nothing with those things for the cause of Christ, we're going to have to give an answer for that. And if we're not faithful in things that are least, how's God going to give us anything worthwhile? If we haven't demonstrated we're going to be faithful in monetary things. And then in 10 through 17, we have to know what is the true riches. And he talks to them about this here. Uh, true riches are not the money. He says you can't serve money. And if you love money, you're not going to be able to serve God. If money and self and pleasure are the ends of your life, you're not going to be able to do much service for God. But God expects you to use that part of your life that He gives you because He knows you need those things. You need money and you need a car and you need a house to live in. And you may even need a computer. I don't know that we need a TV, but we... That wouldn't necessarily have to be wrong, though in most of our lives it is wrong for us to look at it very much. But well, the things that you have, those aren't the true riches, the material things. The person of Christ, the person of the Holy Spirit, the power and working and will, the privilege to, to be a witness in this world that is lost. The, the Bible that we have in front of us Perhaps the Bible education and the good church that we go to and the good preaching that God is privileges for us to hear. The time of our life and the potential to do amazing things with the time. And even in monetary value in, in one of the sermons we're going to preach in the New Testament, we see that every one of us have the potential in time of being a millionaire if we spend all of that time accumulating money. But if we spend all of that time doing the work of Christ, we have 
potential that is beyond our imagination in this thing of our lives of 50 and 60 and 70 years that God may give us, especially if we're saved during that amount of time. And accountability. And the things that are most valuable are the things that change eternity. People's life, people are valuable. Souls are valuable. So that Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And even an unsaved man will not argue that, that, that pleasure and power and money and jewels and fame and the things of this world are worth more than their own soul if the Bible's true and they're going to go to hell for all eternity. It's far better to, to go to heaven than it is to have those things for a moment here on earth. Even unsaved men recognize that. And the Pharisees here, see, that was their problem. They were interested in their possession and their pride and their recognition and their power in the Jewish system, in the community. They weren't interested in eternal things. They weren't interested in the true riches. And, and 16 tells us a dispensational truth that the law and the prophets, the Old Testament only came up to the time of John. And we have in the Gospels this transition this preaching of the kingdom between the Old Testament law and the church age. And the king came and offered the kingdom to them. And they were refusing it. Because they did not know and realize the value of God's true riches. And things that will affect people's lives in eternity. Having taught somebody the Word of God. Principles that cause them to live the Christian life. Having shared the gospel with a lost person and God using that somewhere in his life. The accumulated effect of people sowing the seed to bring them to faith. The things of prayer where we get God's answers for other people because we intercede for them before the throne of grace. That we keep them from harm danger. The honor of faithfulness, of giving our lives and our time and our work for the Lord Jesus and work is hard. But a, a, an accumulated life of work done through the person of Christ will be of eternal value and eternal reward. True riches. And have we been faithful in them? What have we done with the money that God has given us? And then what have we done with the true riches that God has given us? And what is 18 all about? What is this verse here? You might say. Why in the world did God put verse 18 here? What does it have to do with the parable about the steward? Or what does it have to do with the man that went to hell? Well, it may not have so much to do with the latter, with Lazarus, but it has a lot to do with true riches and our accountability for things that God has given us. And I think that we have to trust God in the context here. And I think that what he's saying is that marriage and the love of a partner for life is one of those true riches that God has given us. Here is a person that is one with us in the will and intent of God, that we be one spirit and one flesh and one mind and one unit that serves God. It, it is the unit of life. And if you are not faithful to your commitment to that treasure that you are married to, you say, you don't know my wife or my husband. They're not very much of a treasure. They could have been if both of you would have let God have His will. And I know sometimes it takes two. And you may have one power partner that's faithful and the other's not. And that causes all kind of problems. But even then, the faithfulness of the one should and has a responsibility and an impact on the, the waywardness of the other. But we can't hold a bill accountable for another man's decision and another person's actions, even our mates. But I tell you that in the way that God intended it, there is a treasure in your home 
And if you go outside of your home looking for the things that are basic needs in your life, the affection or the praise, the adoration, even the friendship, and it's not wrong to have other friends, but your wife or your husband ought to be the best friend you have. You ought to be uh, concerned about your children more than you are about any other person on the face of the earth other than your wife or your husband. God has given you things in the family and these things can be ruined by unfaithfulness and, and, and consider, a little consideration and improper use of the riches and treasure. If you have a, a wife or a husband, you have a treasure from the Lord. And God has given you a wonderful thing and that's what Proverbs says. That he that has found a wife has found a treasure, a valuable thing. But if you use that treasure for yourself, if you're just married for whatever you can get out of it or how you can manipulate the other or how you can control and use the other or how you can dominate and take out your problems on the other or how you can feel that you're better than the other and or whatever. You're going to miss what God has for you. In that treasure. And that's why he said. Don't put away your wife. And don't commit adultery. Don't seek for uh, affection and gratification. Outside of that marriage commitment. In that marriage unit. God will not bless that. But he will bless your love for your husband and your wife. It is a picture of his love for us, the church. It is a marvelous and wonderful thing. And we are going to give him a gift. And there is an old saying, it's too late to close the door once the horse is out of the barn. And if you wait till you die and go to heaven, and, and if you wait till the judgment seat of Christ occurs to get ready to, to use God's riches, you're going to miss the whole thing and be accountable and sorry and see your whole treasure of life wasted away and burn up in the fire of God's judgment. I tell you now, you know there is that saying, and I have not always liked it, but sometimes I have. And by God's grace, I can say today is the first day of the rest of my life. That every morning when I get up, by the grace of God, if I come into the presence of my Savior and be cleansed in His presence, I have an opportunity to walk with Him and see His will done in my life through me and in me and with me today. I can use the treasures that God has given me today. Every day I can start anew with Him. What are we doing today with the treasures that God has given us? May we use them for Him and His will and His glory and His honor and His praise, I pray. In the Savior's name, we pray that it will be so. Amen.